Well, hello everybody and welcome back to Red Tool House. Uh, we wanted to take this opportunity on this video to do an update. We've been getting a lot of comments and, and people have been reaching out to us saying, hey, what's going on with this or what's going on with that or a couple of videos you talked about this. So we're going to address that with an update video and kind of just bring you all up to speed with what we've got going on. Now that's one of those little uh, challenges that I have with this whole video process. Um, as we're just kind of winging it as we go along, we've gotten into a habit of being more, I would say, educational, but maybe you know, kind of how-to or uh, talking very specific and not doing what most people would call a vlog series, where you just kind of take a, a glimpse in the day in the life of what's going on here at Red Toolhouse. So um, maybe we can do a little bit of a mashup. Maybe our update videos incorporate uh, more of what's going on and, and uh, a look in the life of. So. Uh, we'll do that if you guys like that. We'll continue to do that and, and maybe once a month, maybe do some updates. If you're not interested, then, then obviously let us know and we'll go back to just talking about very topic, subject specific uh, videos. <clears throat> but uh, as we get into this, one update is um, our fruit trees. We planted fruit trees last fall and we put in six, one, two, three, four, yeah, six, six trees uh, last fall and they were just sticks because we got them mail order. We got them from Stark Brothers. And they've uh, really taken off. They've done quite well. I, I still have them caged here to keep the deer from uh, browsing on them. Right now, the deer, there's so much for them to choose from. I'm not as worried about it as I would be later this fall uh, or if we start to get in the dry, dry period of summer. But uh, obviously, got to do a little trimming here, a little weed, uh, weed eating and, and grass mowing. But we also uh, took the opportunity, we ordered some elderberry bushes, and we got those in just uh, a couple weeks ago. And man, those have already taken off like crazy. You got some really good sprouts on them. So excited about that. We're really going to try this, turn this area into a, a multi-variety um, area, not just an orchard, not just be an apple orchard or an apple and cherry orchard. We want to really, um, and again, I'm no, I'm no permaculturalist. I haven't studied permaculture, but I know some of the basics. Uh, really try to build, uh, maybe it's a food forest would be the proper term, but incorporate more items in here. So we'll have, obviously we've got our, our nut bearing trees behind us. We've got all the uh, white oak and there's some hickory mixed in that. And that kind of makes up the canopy. The south is this way. So this is all south facing. So this gets all the good sun. And um, so we've got our canopy there. And then of course, this will be all of our medium growth with the, um, the trees, the fruit trees growing up. We'll provide that medium coverage. And uh, come back, the elderberries of course will be a little bit lower than that. And I'd like to plant some ground cover, maybe do some uh, comfrey, maybe do some uh, uh, pumpkin or some other ground cover type of thing, squash, whatever, to have it just uh, weave in through there and keep the keep the grass at bay. This uh, this hay grass is coming in nicely, but it really I don't cut hay, so it really isn't doing me any good. And I'd like to take advantage of all this space. I have some I have some good water coming off the hill. The road behind us here, um, there's water that comes down in a ditch, so I can start to cut some swales into those ditches and push that water over this embankment to trickle down into my, my tree area there and in my plants. So uh, that's kind of what, what we've got going on now in that area. Well, this is the uh, remnants of our straw bell garden we did last year, and we decided we weren't going to, uh, we weren't going to do it again this year. So in fact, I gotta straighten this up, but I actually have my strawberry plants uh, actually came back and they're taken off. And what's funny is we got uh, straw uh, to put the bell gardens together the bell garden together and we have uh, evidently the uh, straw bells weren't gleaned completely so we have um, some sort of grain I don't know anything about grain so I'm not sure what that is I don't know if that's just wheat or or barley or what but it's coming up in different spots it's, it's kind of cool to see that and then the catnip the catnip is crazy it still took off from last year and these are just weeds um, and then mint mint my goodness mint takes over everything it um, is quite prolific and it's kind of funny it's uh, we take the time to plant mint in our straw bell garden when I mow any of these meadows and it's just full of mint. It's something that grows like crazy around here in these parts. So, so this, is, um, this is something we're going to take all this out and probably my youngest son wants to do some container gardening on his own. So we may uh, rip all this out soon and put together some containers for him. And this is right in the backyard right behind the house. So this would be one of those easy access points. <clears throat> this has, I talked in, in a couple episodes ago about the different types of irrigation that we've used. And of course, the weeds have grown up around this. But here's an example of <clears throat> one of those different types of sprinkler heads that you can use. And I'll just disconnect it here. So this <clears throat> sprinkler head 
<clears throat> excuse me, just looks like a stake that you stick in the ground. And the way it's made is it has a uh, two, two adjustment nozzles on it. It has a, a top nozzle that if this is tight in a certain way, it either shoots a big stream or shoots a little fan. And the same here, these little portions shoot a little fan of, of water out, a little stream, a little fountain. And they work pretty well. Again, just uh, a very cheap uh, product on, uh, that it got off Amazon, probably Chinese, Chinese manufactured. Uh, but it worked pretty well last year. We hooked it up to our timer and, and had it tied to our well, our pump system on our well. So it watered the uh, straw bale garden and did a pretty good job there last time. So this will be an area hopefully we'll uh, improve here in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> well, one of our updates, of course, is where we are with our pigs. Uh, one of y'all had inquired what's going on with the piglets and where are we with the sows. And I'm going to be careful here because this is bottomless and this is my most hateful sow. She's, she's angry. She's separated from her babies right now and is in the process of drying up. Well, if the camera picks up, the, you can see her teats there, how they're starting to shrivel up. But she's uh, starting to put weight back on nicely, so I'm impressed with that. The thing that gets me, she and her mom, they're land race, blue butt, whatever you want to call them. Looks like a land race variety. That's what I've always gone with. But I don't know if you can see how well she is. She's literally going through and snipping off every single one of these saplings. There's probably 40 of them in here that she's snapped off. This used to be a week ago, I couldn't walk through here, it was so thick. And she's, uh, she's just biting the tips off of them, the tops off of them, and uh, <clears throat> just totally browsing them down. So you can see, that one's gone, this one's gone, all the leaves are gone off of them. So it just amazes me, the destructive power of a pig. And, uh, you know, obviously as we're trying to clear land, I love this, I love the fact that she does this. Like I said, I couldn't walk through here right now uh, a week ago because it was so, so bushed over. And again, she just wants to snack on the green leaves. Here, snack on the green leaves, pig. Snack, 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 snack. Yep, she knows I'm here, so I'm usually the bearer of the food. I think she can smell the slop I have in my side-by-side -side as well. Well, I showed you the sow, so here are the piglets. This is what the piglets uh, are like right now. And they're actually locked in this corral on the barn. Uh, because we're weaning them right now, they are, um, I believe they're 10 weeks old. So I've gone a little longer than I normally do. I normally go about eight weeks. Uh, but they're being weaned right now, so uh, that's why they're hanging out in here. Got to keep them away from the mamas. Uh, we ended up with 12. I believe in our last video we were talking about the loss that we were, were having some issues with uh, uh, them being crushed. And just, we think it was just temperature related. It was just too cold. And uh, my barn wasn't, uh, I didn't have enough, uh, good enough infrastructure to handle them so uh, but they're doing pretty well it's kind of ridiculous if you look at the, the crossbreeding their ears they all look like satellite dishes i'm used to their ears coming down some of them are flopping over like duroc in land race but the rest are sticking up and it's kind of ridiculous they kind of look like gremlins uh, but they're doing well they're a little aggravated obviously they'd like to get out of here and i don't blame them this is the one time that I, I start to develop an odor in, uh, on the farm from the pigs. And obviously I could be putting, uh, I could combat that again with a deep litter method. I could be putting um, uh, sawdust down or hay down, those type of things. But usually what I find is, um, since I'm only going to wean them for, for maybe a week to a week and a half, uh, depending on how well the mamas dry up, then I will, um, uh, I'll just come in here and muck this out and that's, uh, that's good compost for the garden. Uh, so I won't worry about mixing too much uh, uh, carbon in with all this. But you can see they're, uh, <laughs> they're acting like pigs. Even though they've been, the boars have been cut, they still have a, uh, an instinct to breed. As young as they are, they start to get into that whole dominance thing. So it's, uh, it's kind of funny to see. So what else has been going on at, the, at Red Tool House? Well, we've had, uh, had a lot of rain this year the spring so far and it's uh, actually getting a bit ridiculous how much rain we've had so it's uh, delayed some of our plans to uh, to move some dirt and get some grass planted this uh, area behind me in the barn area I still want to get it grassed in because it's uh, it's just bare earth right now but I can't I can't get in to smooth the ruts down with my tractor because it's too muddy so I obviously make new ruts I can't box scrape it down uh, but it's starting, the grass is starting to come up simply because of uh, all the weed seeds and everything around. But I really want to get that in there and get it smooth so I can, uh, I can get it on the grade that I want and get my ditch working and all that. 
and really get that greened up. I don't want to do another winter with that being bare dirt. Also did a feed run today, so uh, what I'm doing right now with four sows and 12 piglets that are weaning, feed consumption is up, of course, because uh, they're not getting the uh, nourishment from mama's teats anymore. So they're having to eat feed. So uh, uh, I think I've discussed these before, my feed lockers here. These are old uh, toolboxes off deuce and a half, the old military trucks. And they make great feed lockers. I can get exactly 600 pounds of pig feed in one. And I think I can get 12 bags, 50 pound bags of chicken feed in the other. I leave the chicken feed in the bags because I transport it down to the chicken pasture. And since the pigs I usually feed right here in this area, I go ahead and open the bags up and dump it in the locker. This locker is, there's no holes big enough that a mouse or a rat can get in. And when they, when the lids close down and I bolt them down, then it keeps it rat and mouse proof as well, which is nice because the rats they do, do tend to get a little bad around here at times. So we have to uh, keep that down as much as possible. So we'll unload the feed. Well, let's see if I can uh, move feet and talk at the same time. I may not be that gifted. I always like to save the 100-pound uh, feed sacks. Or I'll do the 100 pounds first and then move to the 50-pounders. That way, when I got to pick them up, I feel like I'm Superman. I can just throw them around. Something about getting old has something to do with it. Well, my wife reminded me that several had inquired about my weaning process. How do I actually go about weaning the pigs? Well, it's one of those things where I've, I've said this enough. You're probably sick of me hearing, probably sick of hearing me say it, but infrastructure is key when it comes to pigs. And with pastured pigs, if that's what you go for, it's be almost impossible to wean a pig out on pasture. There's just no way to separate it. You can try some electric fence. You can do those type of things, natural barriers, all that. A piglet is going to want to get to its mama, so you're going to have to have Fort Knox built to keep a piglet separated from its mama for the amount of time you need to do. So what do we do? We, we've taken the barn and I've done just a couple little modifications that allow me to change with a couple, take a board down here, add a board there. It allows me to convert the barn over into a weaning stall. And then after they're done weaning, I can take it back to a barn. I'm actually anxious where my camera is sitting right now is where my tractor normally sits. And right now you see it out there in the weather, which I don't like. So as soon as these piglets get weaned, then this gate and this piglet panel, a pig panel will come down and I can park my tractor back in here as well. So looking forward to that time. All right, last bag. Let me detail what we're doing with the weaning pasture. So how do I wean? Well, this, you, you probably can't tell. My videos um, are not that consistent, but this pasture where these, are, I keep saying pasture, this paddock where these piglets are is where uh, they farrowed, where my sows farrowed this year. This was obviously full of hay and, and we had our tarps on the wall there and they, uh, they farrowed in here. Well, um, obviously they've eaten down all the hay and kind of turned this back into dirt. But what I do is the, the sows, I have a gate here that opens up to the pasture so they can come down off the hill come through the corral and they could step into this this um, enclosure or they could step into the enclosure where I'm standing. Um, the, the two sows kind of separated. This is how I had them farrowing. I had one farrowing here and one farrowing and the one behind me. Uh, so they could be far enough away from one another but still be in the barn. So while after the piglets were, were born and they're up running around doing all that stuff, the sows would sometimes leave this area. They had the ability to go out into the pasture all they wanted to and take their piglets with them. Sometimes they would, sometimes they just hang out here because there was food and water and, and quite frankly after giving birth they didn't want to go too far. So um, they hang out here. Well, What we did is I just came down one morning um, prior to feeding and you can see the piglets are a little skittish. Yeah, they don't, they're a little scared of me. So um, I used that to my advantage and this board right here, I, would, I took that board down. Well, the piglets, I had that board down for quite a few weeks, and the piglets, they just wanted to pass from mama to mama, uh, finding the available teat, and so they would just squeeze right under there, go back and forth. Well, obviously the sows couldn't do that. They could not go squeeze under that board. The piglet could squeeze right under there without any, prob without any problems. 
So what I did is I came down one day um, that was time to wean. Actually, I did that last Wednesday, I believe. Came down last Wednesday. I think it was in the evening. I came down last Wednesday evening and uh, just tacked up this hog panel right here. Uh, you know, board on the top, board on the bottom, because it's just a standalone hog panel. Even these guys are going to go right through that. They're going to make it, they're going to bend it into a pretzel. So I made sure that I had two by four on the top, two by six on the bottom, had a really strong uh, uh, nailer there to nail to. So I closed that off. All they had was the board to squeeze under to get out of here now. So just coming through this other, other corral area here, it just spooked them all. So they all squeeze right under here. The sow just goes on like nothing's, nothing's happening. The piglets all squeeze under there, and I just simply drop the board, tack it back in place with a couple nails, and voila, there we go. I've got uh, a corral. Now the one thing I discovered was this wall over here uh, to the right was too small. Crazy pig was too small, and, and uh, these pigs, as they were piglets, as they were getting spooked about being closed in in here, they were run over that corner, and they were actually stacking up on top of one another to the point where one was getting ready to go over. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's, it's, I'd never seen them stack like that. Like they were uh, little gymnastic guys there. So uh, I just put that board across there and this, just did some other things here to just kind of foul them from, from getting out. So it's, um, it's now Monday, so this is, day, this is the end of day five of their weaning. And by looking at, uh, at Mercy back there on the hill, she's probably still another good six days out before drying up. So we may end up going a full two weeks. But I've got water. I've got feed, and they're pooping all right in this area right here, actually around their water. And uh, that's the area they're going, so that'll be the area I focus on when it's time to muck out. But that's, that's weaning. It's pretty simple. Now, uh, obviously, I had to make sure that the sows couldn't get back in here, because even they are, she's, like I said, she's ticked off right now. She's back here breaking saplings again. Um, she's ticked off right now. She wants to get in here. So I had to close this gate there. So she can't get in because she could obviously come right through this hog panel without any, any problem. She wouldn't give a second thought. She could even come through these boards because these are all nailed on this side. And if she was trying to come through here, then there's no way in the world I'm stopping that. So I have kind of a double barrier there. So she, the, the sows can't get in through the corral. There's electric on the back side of this wall. So they're obviously not going to try to come through those, uh, those boards. Uh, so they can't get into the corral and then come into these, uh, these enclosure areas. So that's, that's weaning. Now, I, I usually take the opportunity while I've got them in here, and this is when I would warm, worm them. I use injectable warmer. But you can go back, uh, just go back through my episodes, and you'll see uh, last year when we wormed our piglets, um, yeah, the process of how we did that. I won't, I won't waste time documenting that again since that's been fully documented. But that's how we wean. Well, talking about uh, angry, angry sows and angry pigs, if I can get through this mud without breaking my neck, um, I'll show you an example of what happens when a 600-pound sow says, nope, I'm not going that way, I'm going this way. Um, I'll use my uh, secondary camera here because I'm not putting my tripod in this mud. Well, this is a standard uh, pipe gate that you see that you can get at Tractor Supply or Rural King or any of those places. And... Um, so this is the uh, point I was just talking about. You can see uh, Mercy on the hill there, just wailing on sapling. My goodness, she's cleared that whole hillside almost. But I had another hog in here, Merida, who she didn't fare this year. She's, this was her year off. So she, uh, as I was weaning, she just was in here sleeping in the barn, just kicking it. She liked to be in here. It was a cool evening, so she just kind of got caught up. So um, I got the sows out of here, got the piglets in the... Um, in the area they needed to be in, but Merida was kind of hanging out here in no man's land. Well, unfortunately, she got right up against this electric right here, uh, against the barn, and hit that. And of course, you know, I'm, I've got my electric fence really rocking right now. So she hit that, and that lit her up, and she went right through that fence like it was, or that gate like it was nothing. Now, obviously, the gate's too high. You can see how some erosion here is eating out underneath it, and the gate that made the gate too high. So they invited her to try to go under it. And once a pig gets its snout under something, then it's all over. But it just fascinated me how quickly that bent. I mean, obviously it aggravated the crap out of me, but I was just fascinated by how strong these animals are. And I can't stress enough, man, do, you know, even if you think these are pets, you cannot trust these animals. They will, they will take you out in no time. I mean, watch, watch your girl up there. She's gonna reach over and break another sapling off. She's looking for one. She's not gonna do it now I got the camera on her. But uh, you just imagine the jaw strength it takes to snap those saplings like they are. And just imagine that wrapping around your leg or your arm if you're uh, in a pasture or corral there in a tight space and you've uh, 
you've cornered one of these pigs. So uh, if you raise hogs, man, you got to keep that in mind. Don't uh, don't let them get you. But uh, and the, you know these gates are obviously the, they're not the heavy duty ones. These are the cheapest ones you can buy. So they are a little flimsy. But um, just as an example, I went to stand on that to try to straighten it back out, thinking, oh, if she bent it up, I can bend it back down. I'm 215 pounds. I'm bounce up and down try to straighten that out. No, I was making the whole barn column shake. I wasn't about to bend that back. So uh, so yeah, there's a little proof of of what a 600 pound bulldozer can do there. Well, something else that's going on is uh, the beginnings of our garden, and and I'm no gardener. I'll be the first to admit. So if I do any videos on gardening, it's probably not going to be how tos. It's going to be how not tos, or don't do this. But what we've been working on is is soil building. Um, West Virginia has, has tons and tons of red clay, and to the point that water just stands anywhere. So this is an area, this area I'm standing in is actually a depression and this is, um, what I'm standing on is actually muck out from around the barn from this winter. So this is a mixture of, of dirt, a little bit of erosion, and a little bit of clay that's come off the hill and of course lots and lots of pig poop. So it's been all mixed in, in this winter. So I've scooped all that out and built this up. This is actually about a foot, foot deep of fill here. Uh, to try to to get this level this this was a kind of a depression So I wanted to build this up and try to get this strip of ground here to be about the same elevation I've got a creek right here right behind me that uh, runs water um, Well here the past couple years. It's run water 12 months out of the year. So it's been good producer um, So we've taken some of this dirt and then over in another spot there was uh, against a hill there was um, a log staging area from where we had the place timbered 17 years ago and a lot of those logs had rotted down, uh, a lot of good detritus and a lot of other things there that had built up. So we had went in there and scooped that out. And I, I brought probably 12 uh, tractor uh, scoops full. And my, I think my tractor is just a little under a cubic yard. So uh, you can imagine 12 cubic yards of, of good soil. In fact, I knew it was good when you, know, you look at this poop encrusted uh, clay, it still compacts. If this was wet, I'd stand on it and or, or you know, I could make uh, clay balls out of it. You can kind of see it's kind of hard right now. If I was over here where the tomato plants are, I'd actually sink right into it because this is nice and loamy. It breaks apart real nice. So this is really good stuff. So that's actually why I moved my tomatoes down and planted here. Um, as we do uh, lasagna method is what we may try in this little spot. We're just going to test things this year and see how it goes. I've got plenty more of that dirt over here that I'm going to scoop out and expand the garden as we get things going. We're, we're kind of running out of time. Over mid-May we should be putting stuff in the ground now and I've got tomatoes in but we should be getting other stuff in so it's uh, it's one of those things we'll, we'll just see if we can stay up on it. Now the thing I really like uh, and been thinking about this year is, is playing around with swales and water management. Again in West Virginia we've got all this sloped ground so we've got plenty of opportunity to harvest water in different ways but you can see right here to my right is this little puddle. Uh, I've got a stream that comes down right past the barn, runs down through the pasture, comes underneath my road where my camera is sitting, <clears throat> and comes out a little pipe. And, and we had, when we rerouted the creek last year, um, I didn't mess with rerouting that ditch. That ditch should have gone over and just dumped right into the creek. So I've just left that pipe where it is and just wanted to see how this uh, water was going to kind of meander as it came out of the pipe. Well, it comes right down here, and since I put all this muck out, it formed a little, uh, you can't call it a pond, but just a little tiny impoundment. And up until yesterday, that was about a foot deep and, and maybe six feet wide. Now, the way that's, that's kind of neat to have that little water catchment here that's always going to keep this ground moist, this clay, it'll keep absorbing that. And that may be, um, uh, you know, the concept of a swale, that may be uh, something that takes an opportunity there to, to help draw in water. You can see how green the grass is around it and how much taller it is. Uh, so it's it's rich in nutrient because it's it's like it's going through the corral So it's like going through a pig tea bag So it's picking up all this stuff bringing it down and washing it in this area So I'm I'm not ready to dump that over into the creek right now I'm going to take advantage of this and um, And let that come down and collect because there's it's really putting together depositing some good good rich soil there uh, We got tomatoes in uh, we did uh, uh, we'd like to do paste style tomatoes. I'm not a tomato eater. I, I'm, I can't eat a tomato um, by itself, but I can eat them in everything else. It's crazy. I know. Weird. But we've got uh, Salsi, San Marzano, and then we've got three, um, three other varieties that I, I don't remember. I know one's Lillian's Heirloom, uh, Caspian Pink is another one, and number three. 
no idea. But that's where we are right now. And again, uh, just this this netting obviously is not going to do much uh, for the deer once these things start bearing fruit. This is uh, just very rudimentary, just a very temporary element here to, to just discourage them um, as they start building and, and start putting uh, fruit on. Then we'll definitely have to do some some electric and do all those type of things to keep them out. Well, our chicken tractor is done for our meat chickens. And I'll get into detailing this and this whole process. Again, I, my game plan was to keep all that uh, together for a big discussion about, uh, about the whole process. Oh, look, a big tent caterpillar. You're going to love this. Here's a little treat for y'all. Tent caterpillar. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so the, the tractor, this is the John Siskovich model that, uh, that we built. And again, um, John Siskovich, uh, Farm Marketing Solutions, has a farm up in Connecticut. He has a book. That's what I uh, bought to do these plans. And I'm so impressed with this tractor. As I mentioned, our giveaway for May for our email newsletter people is a uh, copy of his book. I'm going to send uh, someone a copy of his book as we draw randomly from our email newsletter. So be sure to sign up for that. Um, but really, really like this tractor. I've, I've had uh, the other tractor. Um, my other tractor was just a, kind of a, just a, a rectangle, and I've had it for four or five years, actually longer than that. I think I've had that maybe almost seven years now, and it worked fine. Uh, limited on some uh, some issues, uh, access and those type of things, but I really like this with uh, the door, uh, the tarp covering, uh, the uh, hardware cloth again on the wheels. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time detailing that because I want to save that for. Uh, for the uh, overall video of, of the comparison of raising our meat birds from start to finish. We're going to butcher in a couple weeks. Uh, we're going to butcher actually after Memorial Day. But uh, it's just fascinating how, uh, how well this, this whole concept worked. Again, it worked fine with my old tractor, but this, this is just more user friendly. Um, but you can see the swath in the grass here where uh, as I, I come down each morning and move the tractor, move it one length of, uh, of itself, and uh, the chickens, of course, have just done an incredible job of uh, grazing and pooping. And, and if you go back, you can see the strata. This was yesterday. This was the day before yesterday. And as you go back seven or eight days, you can see the grass is starting to come back. It's actually coming back a little greener and a little thicker there. So uh, it's a really neat process. And again, I've got, I've got a lot of grass here. You know, one tractor. I could, uh, I could do laps here all, you know, all year long and, and never have an issue because the grass would be recovered and back by the time I make my second lap. Now, if I got four or five tractors, then I'd have to start going in some other areas there. But uh, I really like this. And my plan in looking at this and, and looking at John's plans and how he built this, uh, the chicks that we have that we detailed in our last video, the, uh, the Cucumarins and the uh, Wyandots, we actually, uh, I think I'm going to build a second tractor and put them in it and actually convert this to more of an egg mobile. So it'll still be the tractor concept where you drag it, but my, uh, what I'm working on plans wise is to add a nesting box to the back of this area that the chickens would access from the inside, of course, but we as humans could just come lift the lid to access the eggs. And of course, I'd have to put some roosting bars in there across, uh, across the main supports. But I think that would do great for a, uh, an egg mobile. Now in the winter time, just like the issues I have in my main chicken flock in the winter time, then I would have to put them some somewhere else but my goodness I think uh, probably eight months out of the year or seven months out of the year I could have them in a tractor and uh, really be getting them on good grass and moving around and really you know juicing up some of my pasture here so it's pretty pretty neat I really like that uh, chickens are growing quite well well several weeks ago we reseeded this part of our chicken pasture I call this pasture a and the other pasture is pasture two actually no it's pasture B uh, but this pasture we reseeded with uh, a clover and grass mix. You can see it's, it's coming up quite well. Now obviously you still got some scrub stuff coming up. I'm not that worried about it. The chickens will take care of that. Um, but this is one of those things we're going to run into. And as we get into our housing, chicken housing discussion here in the next, next week or two, uh, we'll address this. Uh, this is just another input, having to reseed this, uh, costs associated with that. Uh, it's no big deal. Um, in the grand scheme of things, but it's just another input. So that's where you get back into this whole free ranging versus pastured versus drag pens versus um, actually having an area for them. Uh, but this is, I'm really happy with how greened up this has become. And you can see there's quite a bit of canopy, uh, even with the amount of uh, little amount of sunlight this gets uh, during the day, it's still greened up quite nicely. So it's, uh, 
it's coming in and, and if I'd turn these chickens loose on this, they would uh, they tear it up pretty quickly. And we'll get into that. We'll, we'll probably be rotating him here within the next couple of weeks, at, probably after Memorial Day as well. We'll rotate him into this and we'll just see how, uh, how fast 90 chickens eat this down. But really happy with how this came up. I love the clover and uh, I almost want to uh, go further out with them just so this gets more established. It's still very young, very tender stuff, which they're going to just yeah, be like a salad bar for them, man. They're going to be all over it. So I'd love to see it get a little bit more established before I turn them loose on it. So we'll see how that goes. Right on. Oh my gosh. I got a splash. Well, we appreciate you guys tuning in again. We ask you to get an opportunity to be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Go to redtoolhouse.com. Down at the bottom, you'll see a button to sign up for our newsletter. And uh, be sure to check us out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Red Toolhouse Farm. And also give us a thumbs up. Oh! <laughs> give us a thumbs up if you like this video. And be sure to subscribe so you'll know when we have new ones coming out. Help me! <laughs> Take care, y'all. <laughs>